welcome to Vineyard Community Church. How's everyone doing? You doing good? I, it was funny for me when I woke up. I was like, man, why am I so tired today? And I was like, I'm just extra tired. And then it, it didn't hit me until I got out and got into my car. I was like, oh, man, I lost an hour of sleep, didn't I? I was feeling it. But I'm, I'm awake now. Is everyone awake and ready for church today? All right, good. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here with us today. We have been in a series since Valentine's Day called The Power of Love, which has challenged us to be kind, humble, respectful, all, all the characteristics that Jesus has. Now, today we are going to tackle a tough word, okay? It's a tough word. It's, uh, for some people, it's kind of a nasty word. It's kind of a dirty word, despicable a little bit. It's one of those words that when you say it, you kind of cringe a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Today, I'm going to drop the F-bomb in church, <laughs> which is forgiveness. I'm talking about forgiveness. I don't, I don't know what, okay, never mind. You really, you got to need Jesus, man, okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about forgiveness. So if you are taking notes or following along on your outline, you can also live tweet with us at Vineyard VA. You can title this speech, Love is Forgiveness. Love is forgiveness. Now, we've been reading through the love chapter in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 13. Go ahead and check this out with me. It is on your outlines. Starting in verse 4, it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Go ahead and highlight and underline that part for me. Keeps no record of wrongs. Now, let's read the rest of the verse because without it, keeping no records of wrongs is kind of hard. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. It never fails. So today, we are going to look at this word, forgiveness. And I truly believe that God is going to challenge, convict, inspire, and encourage people today. Now, but I have a question, though. Has anyone in here ever had a roommate that was just over-the-top messy? You know that roommate that you just, you know, it makes the whole house look bad? Actually, I got another one. You may, you may want to answer this one, like, to yourself, though. Does anyone have a spouse in here that's kind of messy? I got some bold people in here. Other people are like, yeah. It's like, yeah, I've been trying to say something for a while, Pastor Jacob. Thank you. Thank you for letting me. <laughs> um, now, uh, I've been married for a year and a half to my favorite person in the whole world, Erin. Um, she is awesome. She deserves everyone to be excited. Okay. Uh, and we've both learned very quickly that being married to someone isn't the easiest thing in the world. It's not the easiest thing. See, when we were engaged and going through the process of getting married, we couldn't wait to move out and, and live together and be around each other at all times. And we thought every single day of our lives was going to kind of look like this. <laughs> and that's us, you know, and our, and our, our wedding pictures. Look at it. She's so beautiful. And, um, but, you know, after you get into it for a while and you start living with someone a lot, it kind of turns into this a little bit. That's kind of how it feels sometimes. The, the, the scary part was when I told her I was going to do that, she said, oh, put my face on, on, Freddie's, on Freddie's body. I was, like, I was like, man, does that mean she wants to like get in my dreams or something, in my nightmares? I was, I was a little concerned. Okay, it may not be that hard, but at times it can kind of feel like it, right? Well, what we quickly discovered is that when you live with someone and you spend the majority of your time with somebody, they can start to drive you crazy a little bit, right? It could it it, it get to you. For example, in our bedroom, um, to get from the master bedroom bathroom door to the entranceway of the bedroom, it's like traveling through a jungle. I'm talking about lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's more clothes and hangers and dead bodies on the ground. Then, then I, can, I, I don't even understand. You know, I'm always hitting my toe. I'm stubbing my toe every day. And, and I'm like, is it too much to ask for a clear pathway? And I'm not the cleanest guy in the world, but man, since we're on this subject, another thing that drives me crazy, Aaron is always making me repeat myself. 
she's, I'm saying, hey, you want to go to the movies? Huh? I was like, I was like, what do you mean? See, um, it is easy to, uh, you know, look at someone else's mistakes, right? And, and keep everyone else's record of wrong. And, but sometimes it's hard to look at our own, isn't it? And, and so when, uh, when Pastor Annie and Sharon told me that I was going to teach on forgiveness, um, I decided to take a chance and ask Aaron, man, I wonder if there's anything that I do that drives her crazy or offends her. So I'm like, you know, I'm a risk taker. I said, I'll go for it. And so, um, so I walked up to her. I said, hey, Aaron, wait, you look beautiful today. That's how you always got to say it when you know you're about to go for the big punch. I said, I said, hey, Aaron, beautiful, love of my life. Do I, by chance, <laughs> do anything that drives you crazy or offends you, you know, daily or something like that? It's like, of course not me, right? Then she looked at me. She stood, she stood like this. Then all of a sudden, bam, her hip popped out. I was like, and instantly I felt this force hit me. I was like, Phew. I was like, yo, what was that? It was, she had her hip pop, and she said, bam. And then she said, I thought she would never ask. <laughs> then she took out this list and just, just flew out this list of things, of all the things that I do. You know, and the top was, you're too dramatic all the time. You don't take out the trash. You leave the, you leave the chicken in the trash, the whole house smells. I'm like, man, me? Not me, right? I'm perfect. No. See, Aaron and I quickly learned that forgiveness and keeping no record of wrongs is an everyday act of love. It's an everyday act of love. Now, I want to read the Lord's Prayer to you. It, it, something something kind of uh, jumped out on me when I, was, when I was getting ready for this message. And you can read it with me if you know it. I am reading from the NIV. In Matthew 6, it says, This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our, debt, our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, we all like that prayer. We, we love that prayer. It sounds good to us. But what is interesting to me is right after Jesus says that prayer, there's only one section that he decides to highlight, that he decides to go into. Check this out, starting in verse 14. He says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Uh-oh. Sounds like Jesus just dropped the F-bomb, doesn't it? Which actually leads to my tweetable thought today. Forgiveness is love's power of freedom. Forgiveness is love's power of freedom. At Vineyard VA, hashtag love series. And you can tweet that, Instagram that, Facebook that, Snapchat that. If you have none of those things, tell someone at work this week, okay? See, forgiveness is a flow. It's a flow to the forgiveness. Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is a flow that comes from God, from God to us, and from us understanding and receiving that forgiveness for our mistakes. And from that, it goes to other people. It goes to the people around us, and we can forgive others. See, the problem is sometimes we try to forgive people with our own strength, with our own ability, and our own self-will. And that's the reason why we keep, we say we forgive someone, but we keep looking at them bad. And we keep holding that thing over their heads because there's a flow to this thing. It starts from God to us and from us to other people. From us to other people. See, it's easy to pray the Lord's Prayer and it's easy to get excited about grace and we can say, yes, he forgives us our debts. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Your grace is good. It was good yesterday, it's good today, and it's good forever. And we, and we can sing that and pray that. And then as soon as we walk into work this week, we, we look at our coworker with the dirtiest stink face ever. <laughs> or even tonight when you go home, you hold that thing that your spouse did over their head. Or you keep reminding your, your student about the mistakes that they have. 
See, the problem with forgiveness is that the flow gets interrupted. Is that the flow gets interrupted. See, check this out. Jesus says in the Bible in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. See, there is an enemy that wants to keep you in a place of unforgiveness today. There is an enemy that wants you to keep reminding um, the person closest to you of the mistakes that they have made. There's an enemy that wants you to keep bringing up the past mistakes and the wrongs that people have, have, have made. Because Jesus also says in John 8, so if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. See, the enemy, if he can interrupt the flow of forgiveness, the enemy can discredit what Jesus did on the cross which was to die for us, to take our place of punishment and give us forgiveness of sins so we can live in freedom. Now, I want to highlight three things that interrupt this flow of forgiveness. And I have a story in the Bible that I, believe, that I want to read that I believe displays love, forgiveness, and that process, in the in-between process of that. Interruption number one, they hurt me too bad. They hurt me. Too bad. And you know you're they. You know who that, who that person is or who those people are. Check this out in the Bible. Jesus tells this parable, and it's a familiar story that, that the Jewish audience that he was talking to um, would, would have known. It's a story about wrongdoing and the justice that comes from it. But Jesus being Jesus took the story and added a twist to it and took it to another level. Check this out in Luke 15. It says this, it says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. So let me just translate that to you because that sounds real nice and kind of easy. What, this is what it actually is saying. The son walks up to the dad and he says, hey, dad, go ahead and die and give me my money. Dad, you, I don't even need you anymore. You're worthless to me. Just Give me what's, what's mine and get out of my life. Talk about hurt. Talk about pain. Talk about feeling discouraged, man. Now with some creative freedom to this story, uh, I, want, I, I don't think that the son just one day woke up and, and was rebellious against his father. Even though I know a lot of you with teenage kids probably feel like your students become monsters overnight sometimes, but they don't. You can bring them to church every Sunday. We'll love them, okay? Um, see, there's a bunch of small things that lead to a bigger thing. There's a bunch of small decisions that lead to this, and that's probably what happens with the son and, and the father. The son did a bunch of small things that led to his rebellion and disconnection with the, with the father. See, like I read earlier, Jesus compares the enemy to a thief. And a thief doesn't take something that's broken down and doesn't work. A good thief is going to take what is valuable. And the most valuable thing that we have is our relationships with people. It's the people that we're closest with. And the enemy doesn't want you to have that. See, I know I was kind of joking earlier about my bedroom, and I'm actually probably messier than, than Aaron. Uh, but you know what could happen? A messy floor when I hold on to that, then it will build up. And if she does something else I don't like, something else wrong, and I'll hold a new offense over her head, and I'll bring the old one with it. See, and it will keep building up. And then the enemy will come right in and steal what God has set up, what God has designed. The enemy wants you to walk into your workplace and talk negative about that coworker because the enemy knows that you can be a light to that place, that you can bring love to that place. And if the enemy can get you to, to gossip like everyone else, oh man, you'll never make change there. You'll never make impact there. See, the enemy wants you to keep reminding your spouse about all the wrong things that they do because that will bring in division. And when there's division, the flow of forgiveness gets interrupted. It gets interrupted. But Pastor Jacob, you don't understand. I've tried and I've tried and I've talked and I tried and I forgave and I did all these things, but they hurt me too bad this time and I can't let it go. But love keeps no record 
of wrongs. We can't deny that scripture. Check this out in Matthew 18. Then Peter came up to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And the funny thing to this story is this, is Peter was actually trying to really impress Jesus with this comment and make himself out to be very gracious and like holy. Um, see, among Jewish people in that time, you only forgave someone up to three times. Three strikes and you're out. You're done. And, he's, and, and it was also common for Hebrews to believe that the number seven represented the number of perfection. That was God's number. God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. It was the number of perfection. So Peter doubled it and added an additional number to it, and we, he was trying to impress Jesus and be like, hey, we can forgive people up to, like, the perfect number, right? To the holy number, right? That's good, right? I'm good. I'm gracious, right? 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 And Jesus so response to him is this. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And Jesus just starts throwing out sevens. He's like seven plus seven times seven, multiply seven, algebra seven. <laughs> just every math equation that he knows, he just throws it out there. See, what Jesus is saying is, my love is displayed in forgiveness, and don't put your conditions on my unconditional love. He's saying seven times, right? Because three times, you had to, that, that, was, that was messed up, but, but we're seven. But, but if they hit eight, no more forgiveness for me. And Jesus is like, my love is not based on how good you are or how good you act or, or all the right things that you do. I love you just because I love you. And don't put your conditions on my unconditional love. He says it's just overflowing. It's just gracious. And see, the problem is this. Too often we try to put our conditions on God's unconditional love. And he's challenging us above that. See, the son goes up to the father, wishes him death, takes his money. Because sometimes people hurt. And sometimes it's the people closest to us that hurt the most. That, that digs in deep and it's bad. And I'm going to tell you today that God's unconditional love is stronger than the grip of unforgiveness. It's stronger than that. Interruption number one, they hurt me too bad. Interruption number two, I'm waiting for my confession. I'm waiting for my confession. Now I believe this one right here is what keeps us in a place of not forgiving people. They need to know how much they hurt me. They need, I, I, I can't give them the benefit of my forgiveness. They got to know. They got to pay. I can't forgive them. They need my justice, right? We say that. Check this out. Luke 15, the story continues. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he wasted his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was, a, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I sin against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, making me like one of your higher servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. What? Wait a second. He cursed him, stole his money, went out, did crazy things, and the father was waiting for him. And he had compassion for him. Man, I don't know about you, 
But sometimes I have a hard time when I'm driving, if someone cuts me off, to not flip the bird at them. And maybe that's just me. But sometimes when I'm stuck in traffic, I feel like I'm about to lose my salvation. And you're telling me that after what this son did to this father, he was waiting for him and had compassion for him? Did I just read that? My voice got high pitch. It's okay. <laughs> but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And here's his father who's been hurt. He's been offended. The son treated him like crap. He dismissed him like he wasn't even a real person. Yet the Bible says the father was at the watch place of the house looking towards the field to see if his son would, ret would return. But the story gets even crazy. Jesus is telling this story about a, rich, about a rich and powerful father who allowed his disrespectful son to take his money. And the Bible says this boy is living it up. He's partying. He's clubbing. He's doing the stinky leg. <laughs> stinky. Got stinky in here. I'm sorry. And he loses everything. Then a famine comes. He can't eat. He goes to work with, with pig farmers, and this is a Jewish young man, and Jewish people didn't associate with pigs because they were unclean animals. And now Jesus, is he's just taking this story way too far, and he's saying this boy is at an all-time low, and the father is rich and powerful, and you know he had people in the distant land reporting back to him what the son was doing. And now the son is ruining the, family, the family's name. He's disgracing the family. And if I was the father, I would, be, I would be consumed. I would be boiling with anger and bitterness and rage. And I would think to myself, I raised that boy. I treated that boy like a prince. I, I put him through school. I fed his stomach. I did everything for him. And he's going to treat me like this. And how often do we feel the same way about people closest to us? When we, were, when we said our vows, we promised to never hurt each other, but now you treat me like this, and now you do me like that, and my son, and he is acting like this, and my daughter, she's out of control, and I'm just trying to do the best I can, but they don't care. But maybe if they come back to me and apologize with a confession, then maybe I'll talk to them again. Maybe I'll bring them in. But the Bible says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And then Jesus takes it one more step up. He says, and then the father ran to him. And the father ran to him. Now, now, this is just too far. This is a rich and powerful man. They don't run. It's dishonorable. And if you were in the Jewish audience listening to Jesus tell this story, you're actually very familiar with this story. And this story is about a father and son. It is about a rebellious son that, that rebels against the father. But how the story actually goes in the, in the, in the traditional um, point was is a story about God and his justice against sin. And, and how the story originally went was when the son came back, Father God came to the son and smited him down with his strong right hand and said, you go and work as a hired servant. But now Jesus is taking the story and he's saying that Father God doesn't smite us down, but he actually has compassion for us. That, he was, that he's been waiting for us. So wait, 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 wait one second. He's saying that the father ran to the son. So you're telling me that God runs to us? That grace is not man coming to God, but grace is God coming to man exactly how we are in our brokenness and our mistakes and our insecurities and our failures and our shortcomings. God comes to us. He comes right to us. And then Jesus, he just goes a little too crazy. He says the father ran to him and then he threw his arms around him and kissed him on the cheek. 
wait a second, this boy was hanging out with pigs, right? He's he's on clean now, right? So you're telling me that Father God actually runs to us in our on clean state and says, actually, go ahead and just put the on clean things on me because I can take it for you. Come on, don't get me preaching today. (laughs) See, see, see. I think it's safe to say that while the Father was in, the, was in the tower, was in the house, looking towards the field before the boy even had a confession coming in his heart. The father already forgave him. He already had forgiveness in his heart. The son, check this out, the story says, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. I love this because before the boy can confess, The father's already bringing him back into the family. Put a ring on his finger. Put some Nikes on his feet. I mean sandals. Bring out the fried chicken. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I just want to take a moment right here. Because when I read this story... I'm convicted in the core of me because I am not the father. And too often in my life, I'm far away from it. People have hurt me and I want to hold grudges and put them at a distance. And when I read this story, I find myself in the sun. I've hurt people. I thought of myself And I didn't care about how it would affect others. And I am amazed and I am overwhelmed and I am consumed by the grace love of our Father God who takes me in time and time again. Interruption number one, they hurt me too bad. Interruption number two, I'm waiting for my confession. And my third and final interruption for the flow of forgiveness is I'm not really forgiven. And now I got my brother here. He's the better looking one of us. And I have an illustration that I want to do. Because forgiveness is love's power or freedom. The biggest interruption of the flow is that we actually don't believe that God has forgiven us of all the mistakes that we've made, of all the ways that we have hurt people. Because you can't tell me you can experience God's good grace and his favor on your life, but still hold grudges over people. It does not work that way. It doesn't work that way. Let me read this verse to you in 1 Corinthians one more time. It says that God keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God always protects. God always trusts. God always hopes. God always perseveres. God never fails. The hardest truth to forgiveness is that forgiveness has nothing to do with the person or the people that have hurt us, but it has everything to do with us. It has everything to do with our response. And see, the best way to figure this out, it's kind of like you got a rope around you and you're tied up and you know you know God has great things for you. You know God has a purpose for your life. You know God wants to do great things and every time you try to go for it and every time it's like something's just pulling you back and you and you don't understand how can I get and when you look back you see that person that has hurt you. You see that mistake that you have made, but, but what actually happens is when we look back, the biggest thing that we see is the things that we feel like God hasn't forgiven us for. And, and, and 
I messed up there and I hurt these many people and I tried and I'm, and I'm trying to move forward and I can't move forward because every time I do, there's something that reminds me of my mistakes. There's something that reminds me of my shortcomings. There's something that reminds me that I'm a failure, that I'm not good enough, that I can't do it. And I'm going to tell you today, there's too many people living in this tension. There's too many people living in the tension of what God has for them and the life that the enemy has spoken over them. And I'm going to tell you today, and, and I'm going to tell you this, forgiveness is love's power of freedom. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he said, I take it all. Every hurt, every insecurity, every doubt, every fear, every mistake you've made, and every hurt that's been done against you. He says, all you got to do is look towards me. And see, when we look towards Jesus, when we look towards his goodness, when we look towards his favor, when we look towards his grace, and when we understand in the deepest parts of our hearts that he has forgiven us, we can Hold the things that have tried to tie us up. We can look back and say, you are forgiven. You're forgiven today. You don't got to be held back anymore. You don't got to be tied up anymore because there's a Jesus that went to the cross that said, I'll take your pain. I'll take your worry. I'll take your biggest mistakes and I'll throw my grace love on it and you'll be brand new today and you can move towards the purpose that God has for your life. Come on, somebody with some faith in this place today. You don't got to be tied back no more. You don't got to be held back anymore. Because my final thought today is this. Jesus picked forgiveness. Amen. Jesus picked, he didn't have to. He didn't have to pick us. He was perfect. He never sinned. He never made a mistake. He never lied. He never cheated. And he said, I'll take every mistake they ever made and I'll throw it on my shoulders and I'll take the ultimate blow for them so they, so they can have freedom. And my closing story is this. Jesus, beaten and bruised, hung on a cross and in his lowest moment, we see what he was really all about. Because truth is, is that your lowest moments is when your true character comes out. Luke 22 says this, is when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one to his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. The story goes on. It says one of the criminals hurled, hung there, who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence. We are punished justly for what we are getting, for, what our, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he looked to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your paradise. Now this man hanging on the cross, he deserved to be on the cross. He's a bad man. He made mistakes. He's hurt people. He's violated people. His sins got him to that cross and he deserves to be up there. But what are the words of our Savior Jesus? What is the response of his love in that moment? With his broken body and his swollen eyes, he looks over at the man and he says, Truly I tell you, 
Today, you will be with me in paradise. He offers forgiveness. He says, I forgive you. He says, I forgive you of your mistakes. Because forgiveness is love's power of freedom. It is. And it sounds too good to be true. But guess what? God's grace is more tangible than the air we breathe. And it's that good. And it sets us free. Because who the sun sets free is free indeed. Bow your heads at me. Let's pray. God. God, we come to you right now saying we need help with forgiveness. We need help to get there, Lord, because there's people that have hurt us. There's people who are currently hurting us right now as we speak. But we want to be like you, Jesus, who forgave the people that hurt you. Yeah, even as I was preparing for this message for the past few weeks, I feel like the Lord said, tell the people to get to the starting line of forgiveness. The hurt that comes is still a process to deal with. But God is there every step of the way. All you got to do is get to the starting line. Get to that person, get to that thing and say, you know what, I forgive. I forgive. I won't be held back anymore. Because year after year, I've been tied up. And this is my year to break free. And I even feel like the Lord is saying there's people in here who need to get water baptized. We have that baptism next weekend. And God is saying this is your time to be, to know that you're fully forgiven, to be cleansed in the water. You may be in here today and you're saying to yourself, Pastor Jacob, that sounds good, but I don't know this Jesus you really talked about. I never made a decision to follow him or, or trust in him. Maybe you're in here and you have made that decision. But life got in the way. Things happened. And you're here and you're saying, I want to recommit my life back to Jesus. If that's you, right where you are in your chair, I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you or ask you to come up front, nothing like that. But right where you are in your chair, if you want to make that decision to trust Jesus with your life for the first time, or if you want to make that decision to recommit to him, just pray this prayer with me right where you are. Just in your heart, say, Jesus, forgive me. I've fallen short too many times, and I need your grace. Today I trust in you. Today I commit my life to you. Today I'm a Christ follower. In Jesus' name, amen.